Chapter Thirteen of Memoir of Washington Irving by Charles Adams. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Greg Giordano. Chapter Thirteen. In his sketch of Mr. Roscoe of Liverpool, comparing him with other English writers of distinction, Mr. Irving writes. Quote, mr roscoe has claimed none of the accorded privileges of talent he has shut himself up in no garden of thought nor elysium of fancy but has gone forth into the highways and thoroughfares of life he has planted bowers by the wayside for the refreshment of the pilgrim and the sojourner and has opened pure fountains where the laboring man may turn aside from the dust and heat of the day and drink of the living streams of knowledge there is a daily beauty in his life on which mankind may meditate and grow better it exhibits no lofty and almost useless because inimitable example of excellence but presents a picture of active yet simple and inimitable virtues which are within every man's reach but which unfortunately are not exercised by many or this world would be a paradise he has shown how much may be done for a place in hours of leisure by one master spirit and how completely it can give its own impress to surrounding objects like his own lorenzo de Mici, on whom he seems to have fixed his eye as on a pure model of antiquity he has interwoven the history of his life with the history of his native town and has made the foundations of its fame the monuments of his virtues wherever you go in liverpool he perceived traces of his footsteps in all that is elegant and liberal he found the tide of wealth flowing merely in the channels of traffic he has diverted from its invigorating rills to refresh the gardens of literature by his own example and constant exertion he has effected that union of commerce in the intellectual pursuits so eloquently recommended in one of his latest writings and has practically proved how beautifully they may be brought to harmonize and to benefit each other End quote. we have the following touching the royal poet james of scotland an extract closing with a passage whose splendid imagery brilliant words harmonious and graceful construction and musical movement are hardly surpassed in the english language quote, james flourished nearly about the time of chaucer and gower and was evidently an admirer and studier of their writings indeed in one of his stanzas he acknowledges them as his masters and in some parts of his poem we find traces of similarity to their productions more especially to those of chaucer there are always however general features of resemblance in the works of contemporary authors which are not so much borrowed from each other as from the times writers like bees toll their sweets in the wide world they incorporate with their own conceptions the anecdotes and thoughts current in society and thus each generation has some features in common characteristic of the age in which it lived james belongs to one of the most brilliant eras of our literary history and establishes the claims of his own country to a participation in its primitive honors whilst a small cluster of english writers are constantly cited as the fathers of our verse the name of their great scottish compeer is apt to be passed over in silence but he is evidently worthy of being enrolled in that little constellation of remote but never failing luminaries who shine in the highest firmament of literature and who like the morning stars sang together at the bright dawning of british poesy End quote. the author is moving pensively amid the sombre scenery of westminster abbey let us glance at a picture or two quote, while wandering about these gloomy vaults and silent aisles studying the records of the dead the sound of busy existence from without occasionally reaches the ear the rumbling of the passing equipage the murmur of the multitude or perhaps the light laugh of pleasure the contrast is striking with the death-like repose around and it has a strange effect upon the feelings thus to hear the surges of active life hurrying along and beating against the very walls of the sepulchre two small aisles on each side of this chapel 
present a touching instance of the equality of the grave which brings down the oppressor to a level with the oppressed and mingles the dust of the bitterest enemies together in one is the sepulchre of the haughty elizabeth in the other is that of her victim the lovely and unfortunate mary not an hour in the day that some ejaculation of pity is uttered over the fate of the latter mingled with indignation at her oppressor the walls of elizabeth's sepulchre continually echo with the sighs of sympathy heaved at the grave of her rival a peculiar melancholy reigns over the aisle where mary lies buried the light struggles dimly through windows darkened by dust the greater part of the place is in deep shadow and the walls are stained and tinted by time and weather End quote. the author as he retires from the abbey thus meditates quote, what is this vast assemblage of sepulchres but a treasury of humiliation a huge pile of reiterated homilies on the emptiness of renown and the certainty of oblivion it is indeed the empire of death his great shadowy palace where he sits in state mocking at the relics of human glory and spreading dust and forgetfulness on the monuments of princes how idle a boast after all is the immortality of a name time is ever silently running over his pages we are too much engrossed by the story of the present to think of the characters and anecdotes that gave interest to the past in each age is a volume thrown aside to be speedily forgotten the idol of to-day pushes the hero of yesterday out of our recollection and will in turn be supplanted by his successor of to-morrow we have the following picture of an english stage coachman Quote, he is commonly a broad full face curiously mottled with red as if the blood had been forced by hard feeding into every vessel of the skin he is swelled into jolly dimensions by frequent potations of malt liquors and his bulk is still further increased by a multiplicity of coats in which he is buried like a cauliflower the upper one reaching to its heels he wears a broad-brimmed low-crowned hat a huge roll of coloured handkerchief about his neck knowingly knotted and tucked in at the bosom and has in summer time a large bouquet of flowers in his buttonhole the present most probably of some enamoured country lass his waistcoat is commonly of some bright colour striped and his small clothes extend far below his knees to meet a pair of jockey boots which reach about half way up his legs he enjoys great consequence and consideration along the road has frequent conferences with the village housewives who look upon him as a man of great trust and dependence and he seems to have a good understanding with every bright-eyed country lass the moment he arrives where the horses are to be changed he throws down the reins with something of an air and abandons the cattle to the care of the hostler his duty being merely to drive from one stage to another when off the box his hands are thrust into the pocket of his great coat and he rolls about the inn-yard with an air of the most absolute lordliness here he is generally surrounded by an admiring throng of hostlers stable-boys shoe-blacks and those nameless hangers-on that infest inns and taverns and run errands or do all kinds of odd jobs for the privilege of fattening on the drippings of the kitchen and the leakage of the tap-room these all look up to him as to an oracle treasure up his cant phrases echo his opinions about horses and other topics of jockey lore and above all endeavour to imitate his air and carriage every ragamuffin that has a coat to his back thrusts his hands into the pockets rolls in his gait talks slang and is an embryo coachy john bull is thus pictured quote, john bull to all appearance is a plain downright matter-of-fact fellow with much less of poetry about him than rich prose there is a little of romance in his nature but a vast deal of strong natural feeling he excels in humour more than in wit is jolly rather than gay melancholy rather than morose can easily be moved to a sudden tear or surprised into a broad laugh but he loathes sentiment and has no turn for light pleasantry he is a boon companion if you allow him to have his humour and to talk about himself and he will stand by a friend in a quarrel with life and purse however soundly he may be cudgelled his family mansion is an old castellated manor-house gray with age and of a most venerable 
weather-beaten appearance. It has been built upon no regular plan, but is a vast accumulation of parts, erected in various tastes and ages. The center bears evident traces of Saxon architecture, and is as solid as ponderous stone and old English oak can make it. Like all the relics of that style, it is full of obscure passages, intricate mazes, and dusky chambers, and though these have been partially lighted up in the modern days, yet there are many places where you must still grope in the dark. Additions have been made to the original edifice from time to time, and great alterations have taken place. Towers and battlements have been erected during wars and tumults. Wings built in time of peace, and outhouses, lodges and offices run up, according to the whim or convenience of different generations, so it has become one of the most spacious, rambling tenements imaginable. End, quote. End of chapter 13 Recording by Greg Giordano Newport Ritchie, Florida Chapter 14 of Memoir of Washington Irving by Charles Adams. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Greg Giordano. Chapter 14. Mr. Irving had now been five years abroad, and during all this time had been by circumstances detained in England. At length the way was opened for him to gratify his long cherished desire and intention to cross the channel and to visit some of the famous cities and other interesting objects of continental Europe. Of course he first visited Paris, where he resided nearly a year. Here he made several new and interesting acquaintances, among whom was Moore, the poet, who, with his wife, was also residing at that time in Paris. Footnote. Thomas Moore was born in 1779 and was educated in Dublin, his native city. His writings were voluminous, comprising prose as well as poetry. Some of his earlier poems are, unfortunately, defaced by more or less of purency, and have an immoral tendency. But much of his poetry is excellent, and La La Rook comprises strains and passages not excelled in the English language for poetic sweetness and beauty. He died in 1852. End of footnote. Moore was four years the senior of Irving, and on their first acquaintance a mutual and strong friendship commenced between them, which seems to have continued through life. Quote, he is a cheery, joyous fellow, writes Irving in his first notice of him, full of frank, generous, and manly feeling. His acquaintance is one of the most gratifying things I have met with for some time, as he takes the warm interest of an old friend in me and my concerns. End quote. It is needless to add that all such pleasant sentiments were fully reciprocated, and this new and unexpected friendship was one of the special charms for Irving during his residence at the French capital. He also at Paris formed the acquaintance of the English statesman George Canning who showed him much attention and expressed a very favorable opinion of his writings footnote george canning was born in london in seventeen seventy was educated at eton and oxford where he gained high academical honors and evinced great powers of oratory he early devoted himself to politics and in the course of his life sustained numerous important offices he was several times in the cabinet being once premier and several times also in parliament was a foreign ambassador and was offered the important office of governor-general of india he was remarkable as a speaker while in keen and cutting irony sparking wit sarcasm and eloquence he was among the first orators of his time a newspaper of the day announcing his death represents him as quote, endowed with every choice gift of nature had risen from a low condition to the highest office in the state, and centered in himself the best hopes of the best men in the civilized world. He died at Chiswick in 1827. End of footnote. Lord John Russell, now Earl Russell, 
about ten years the junior of Irving, was also among his distinguished acquaintances at Paris. Footnote. Lord John Russell is third son of the Duke of Bedford, born 1792, and is, of course, now an old man. He studied at the University of Edinburgh, and at twenty-one years of age, we find him a member of Parliament, and seems to have been either in Parliament or in the Cabinet the most of his life. He early assumed the position of a parliamentary reformer, and has constantly sustained that character throughout his long public career and has been earnest and efficient in the several reforms which have been carried in Parliament for the last half-century. He was elevated to the peerage in 1861, with the title of Earl Russell. He is an author, as well as a statesman, having employed his pen with history, biography, and fiction, besides some miscellaneous works. End of footnote. Here, too, he met his townsman, John Howard Prane, author of the popular ballad home sweet home footnote john howard payne was born in seventeen ninety two in new york and in childhood evinced a precocious genius for poetry and dramatic exercises and exhibitions he entered union college but remained there only a brief period and in his sixteenth year we find him upon the stage acting the part of young norval at the park theatre new york the most of his subsequent life seems to have been devoted to acting and to dramatic composition performing at home and abroad with varied success of the famous poem home sweet home one hundred thousand copies have been sold up to eighteen thirty two by the original publishers and it is known and sung the world over he was for several years united states consul to tunis and died in eighteen fifty two also Talma, the great French tragedian. Footnote. Talma was born in Paris in 1763, and died there in 1826. He was eminent as an actor of tragedy, to which art he gave his main attention. End of footnote. And Kenny, an Irish dramatic writer of some note, author of Raising the Wind, a farce in which figures Jeremy Diddler, one of the most famous characters of humorous fiction. Just previous to leaving Paris, he also made the acquaintance of Bancroft, the historian, who was then traveling in Europe. Footnote. George Bancroft is a native of Worcester, Massachusetts, born in 1800, studied at Exeter and Cambridge, graduated at 17, embarked for Europe, entered the University of Göttingen, where for two years he pursued an extensive plan of study, comprising German, French, in Italian literature, Oriental languages, civil, ecclesiastical, and natural history, Greek and Roman literature, and antiquities, and Greek philosophy. He received the degree of Doctor of Philosophy at twenty years of age, and in the following spring he commenced traveling through various parts of Europe, and conversed with many learned and eminent men. Returning home in 1822, he served a year as tutor at Harvard, in 1823, in connection with Dr. Cogwell, established the Round Hill School at Northampton, a classical school of high standing. In 1834, he published the first volume of his History of the United States, which has up to this date, 1869, reached the ninth volume. It has received great applause, although the last volume has been severely criticized, owing to its alleged injustice to one or two revolutionary officers. Mr. Bancroft was in President Polk's cabinet, and through his influence the Naval School was established. From 1846 to 1849, he was United States Minister to England. End of footnote. He speaks of other interesting acquaintances acquired at Paris, so that his society seems to have been fully as extensive as was consistent with the special purpose of his residence there. End of chapter 14. Recording by Greg Giordano, Newport Ritchie, Florida. Chapter 15 of Memoir of Washington Irving by Charles Adams. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Mr. Irving, though having designed to proceed immediately on his continental travels, suddenly changed his purpose 
and in July, 1821, started on his return to England, and reached London on the day previous to the coronation of George IV. From a position outside Westminster Abbey, he witnessed the grand procession passing in. Meeting Sir Walter Scott on the following day, and telling him of his success in witnessing the display, and that he knew not how to manage to secure admission within the Abbey, Tutmond, replied Scott, you should have told them who you were, and you would have got in anywhere. After a brief stay in London, he proceeded, in company with the artist Leslie, to Birmingham on a visit to his sister, Mrs. Van Wart. Their first day's ride brought them to Oxford, where a violent rain during all the following day confined them to the inn. As they mounted the coach on the following morning, Leslie remarked to Irving something about a certain stout gentleman who had accompanied them to Oxford two days before. This was the suggestive hint that gave birth to the story of the stout gentleman. The idea seized strongly and at once the fancy of Irving, and at every opportunity as they went on their journey his pen was working with the greatest rapidity, so that by the time they reached Birmingham the sketch was nearly finished. All this might be ranked among the curiosities of literature, and yet doubtless the history of literature would reveal to us multitudes of similar examples. A single word, or a glance, or walk, or dream, has proved the slight germ of some beautiful or stately growth. Nor is this to be set down as merely casual or accidental. A great yet secret providence has more to do with the human mind and its driftings and inspirations than short-sighted people ever come to discern. Think with yourself, says the judicious and pious Dr. Watts, how easily and how insensibly, by one turn of thought, he can lead you into a large scene of useful ideas. He can teach you to lay hold on a clue which may guide your thoughts with safety and ease through all the difficulties of an intricate subject. Think how easily the author of your being can direct your motions by his providence, so that the glance of an eye, or a word striking the ear, or a sudden turn of the fancy, shall conduct you to a train of happy sentiments. By his secret and supreme method of government, he can draw you to read such a treatise, or converse with such a person, as may give you more light into some deep subject in an hour than you could obtain by a month of your own solitary labor. Think with yourself, with how much ease the God of spirits can cast into your mind some useful suggestion, and give a happy turn to your own thoughts, or the thoughts of those with whom you converse, whence you may derive unspeakable light and satisfaction in a matter that has long puzzled and entangled you. He can show you a path which the vulture's eye has not seen, and lead you by some unknown gate or portal out of a wilderness and labyrinth of difficulties wherein you have been long wandering. From Watts on the Improvement of the Mind This visit of Irving to his sister proved unfortunate, he being detained there about four months by ill health, which effectually prevented him from the use of his pen. The tidings received during this interval of the death of a niece and of his brother William greatly added to his affliction. His brother's death especially was a severe bereavement. He had anticipated the sad event, but when the news actually came, he describes it as one of the dismalest blows he had ever experienced. This brother, being the eldest, seems to have been as a kind father to all his junior brothers, and a man full of worth and talents, beloved in private and honored in public life. After about four months of invalid life with his sister at Birmingham, Mr. Irving returned to London, his health yet unrestored. He soon, however, sent for publication at New York the first volume of Bracebridge Hall. The second volume soon followed and the work appeared in New York, May 21, 1822, and in London two days later. End of chapter 15 Recording by Maria Casper Chapter 16 of Memoir of Washington Irving by Charles Adams This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Bracebridge Hall may be considered a sort of continuation of the sketchbook, and comprises various descriptions, essays, and tales relating to English character and habits, 
and especially as applicable to the olden time. The position of the author is that of a resident for the time at the hall, and many of the incidents and scenes of one and another sketch or tale seem to have arisen to his observation during his agreeable sojourn there. Lady Lillycraft, for example, a visitor to the hall, has brought with her two pet dogs, which are pictured thus. One is a fat spaniel called Zephyr, though heaven defend me from such a Zephyr. He is fed out of all shape and comfort. His eyes are nearly strained out of his head. He wheezes with corpulency, and cannot walk without great difficulty. The other is a little old grey muzzled curmudgeon with an unhappy eye that kindles like a coal if you only look at him. His nose turns up, his mouth is drawn into wrinkles so as to show his teeth. In short, he has altogether the look of a dog far gone in misanthropy, and totally sick of the world. When he walks he has his tail curled up so tight that it seems to lift his feet from the ground, and he seldom makes use of more than three legs at a time keeping the other drawn up as a reserve. This last wretch is called beauty. These dogs are full of elegant ailments unknown to vulgar dogs, and are petted and nursed by Lady Lillycraft with the tenderest kindness. They have cushions for their express use on which they lie before the fire, and yet are apt to shiver and moan if there is the least draught of air. When anyone enters the room they make a most tyrannical barking that is absolutely deafening. They are insolent to all the other dogs of the establishment. There is a noble stag-hound, a great favourite of the squire's, who is a privileged visitor to the parlour, but the moment he makes his appearance these intruders fly at him with furious rage, and I have admired the sovereign indifference and contempt with which he seems to look down upon his puny assailants. When her ladyship drives out, these dogs are generally carried with her to take the air, when they look out of each window of the carriage and bark at all vulgar pedestrian dogs. The following extract from the chapter on family relics is interesting, as well for the moral involved as for its beauty. The writer alludes, among other things, to the picture gallery of the hall, as abounding most with mementos of past times. There is something strangely pleasing, though melancholy, in considering the long rows of portraits which compose the greater part of the collection. They furnish a kind of narrative of the lives of family worthies, which I am enabled to read with the assistance of the venerable housekeeper, who is the family chronicler, prompted occasionally by Master Simon. There is the progress of a fine lady, for instance, through a variety of portraits. One represents her as a little girl with a long waist and a hoop, holding a kitten in her arms, and ogling the spectator out of the corners of her eyes as if she could not turn her head. In another we find her in the freshness of youthful beauty, when she was a celebrated belle, and so hard-hearted as to cause several unfortunate gentlemen to run desperate and write bad poetry. In another she is depicted as a stately dame in the maturity of her charms. Next to the portrait of her husband is a gallant colonel, in full-bottomed wig and gold-laced hat, who was killed abroad. And finally her monument is in the church, the spire of which may be seen from the window, where her effigy is carved in marble, and represents her as a venerable dame of seventy-six. There is one group that particularly interested me. It consisted of four sisters of nearly the same age, who flourished about a century since and if I may judge from their portraits, were extremely beautiful. I can imagine what a scene of gaiety and romance this old mansion must have been when they were in the heyday of their charms, when they passed like beautiful visions through its halls, or stepped daintily to music in the revels and dances of the cedar gallery, or printed with delicate feet the velvet verdure of these lawns. When I look at these faint records of gallantry and tenderness, when I contemplate the faded portraits of these beautiful girls, and think, too, that they have long since bloomed, reigned, grown old, died, and passed away, and with them all their graces, their triumphs, their rivalries, their admirers, the whole empire of love and pleasure in which they ruled, all dead, all buried, all forgotten, I find a cloud of melancholy stealing over the present gaieties around me, 
I was gazing in amusing mood this very morning at the portrait of the lady whose husband was killed abroad, when the fair Julia entered the gallery, leaning on the arm of the captain. The sun shone through the row of windows on her as she passed along, and she seemed to beam out each time into brightness, and relapse into shade, until the door at the bottom of the gallery closed after her. I felt a sadness of heart at the idea that this was an emblem of her lot. A few more years of sunshine and shade, and all this life and loveliness and enjoyment will have ceased, and nothing be left to commemorate this beautiful being but one more perishable portrait, to awaken, perhaps, the trite speculations of some future loiterer like myself, when I and my scribblings shall have lived through our brief existence and been forgotten. In The Stout Gentleman is a picture of things with a feverish man confined during a wet Sunday at a country inn. A wet Sunday at a country inn. Whoever has had the luck to experience one can alone judge of my situation. The rain pattered against the casements, the bells tolled for church with a melancholy sound. I went to the windows in quest of something to amuse the eye but it seemed as if I had been placed out of the reach of all amusement. The windows of my bedroom looked out among tiled roofs and stacks of chimneys, while those of my sitting-room commanded a full view of the stable-yard. I know of nothing more calculated to make a man sick of this world than a stable-yard on a rainy day. The place was littered with wet straw that had been kicked about by travellers and stable-boys. In one corner was a stagnant pool of water surrounding an island of muck. There were several half-drowned fowls crowded together under a cart, among which was a miserable crestfallen cock, drenched out of all life and spirit, his drooping tail matted as it were into a single feather, along which the water trickled from his back. Near the cart was a half-dozing cow, chewing the cud and standing patiently to be rained on, with wreaths of vapour rising from her reeking hide. A wall-eyed horse, tired of the loneliness of the stable, was poking his spectral head out of a window, with the rain dropping on it from the eaves. An unhappy cur, chained to a doghouse hard by, uttered something every now and then, between a bark and a yelp. A drab of a kitchen wench tramped backward and forward through the yard in pattens, looking as sulky as the weather itself. Everything, in short, was comfortless and forlorn. Excepting a crew of hard-drinking ducks, assembled like boon companions round a puddle, and making a riotous noise over their liquor. The Edinburgh Review thus glances at a few other pieces of the Bracebridge Hall miscellany. Ready Money Jack is admirable throughout, and the old general very good. The lovers are, as usual, the most insipid. The gypsies are sketched with infinite elegance as well as spirit, and Master Simon is quite delightful in all the varieties of his ever-versatile character. Of the tales which serve to fill up the volumes, that of Dolph Heliger is incomparably the best, and is more characteristic, perhaps, both of the author's turn of imagination and cast of humour than anything else in the work. The student of Salamanca is too long and deals rather largely in the commonplaces of romantic adventure. End of chapter 16 Recording by Maria Casper Chapter 17 of Memoir of Washington Irving by Charles Adams This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Greg Giordano Memoir of Washington Irving by Charles Adams Chapter 17 Bracebridge Hall being off his hands, Mr. Irving gave himself a season of relaxation, and, receiving numerous invitations from fashionable people in London and vicinity, he passed the succeeding summer as gaily as the imperfect condition of his health would permit. Early in autumn he embarked for Holland, spending several days at Rotterdam, The Hague, Amsterdam, and one or two other places. He ascended the Rhine to Aix-la-Chapelle, 
to enjoy the use of the baths he also spent a short time at my aunt's frankfurt and heidelberg he was greatly delighted with the scenery of the rhine and the fruitfulness and beauty of the country generally while the atmosphere as he inhaled it seemed to exert an invigorating and balmy influence upon his physical system he afterward journeys further up the rhine enjoys the baths at baden and is charmed with the delightful scenery everywhere presented to view he then sets his face eastward toward vienna passing the black forest and crossing Württemberg to salzburg he for a few days refreshed himself with various little excursions visited the famous salt works looked with pleasure upon the tyrolese mountains stretching along the south and already october one capped with snow and pronounced salzburg one of the most romantic spots which he had ever beheld thence after a few days he resumed his journey and travelling all night he was the next day at vienna this great and opulent capital was not to his taste he found it a city given to luxury and dissipation rather than devoted to more elevated pursuits and after a brief stay with one or two excursions abroad he took leave for dresden on the eighteenth of november the tedious complaint which had so long afflicted him was now almost entirely healed and brighter prospects than before seemed opening before him on the fifth day after traversing a rude and gloomy country he reached prague whence two and a half days more brought him to dresden the whole aspect of things suddenly changes as he passes from bohemia and descends the mountains into saxony and excellent roads pleasant farmhouses rosy gleams on the still waters of the elbe the fishing boats the balmy skies joined with a view of the distant city with its cluster of spires and domes all combined to throw an air of enchantment around the closing hours of his journey dresden was his home for six months and seems to have proved a delightful residence his literary fame had preceded him and he was at once introduced to the first society of the place irving was at this time in his fortieth year and we have the following description of him as he now appeared by one of his dresden friends an english lady sojourning there Quote, he was thoroughly a gentleman not merely externally in manners and look but to the innermost fibres and core of his heart sweet-tempered gentle fastidious sensitive and gifted with the warmest affections the most delightful and invariably interesting companion gay and full of humour even in spite of occasional fits of melancholy which he was however seldom subject to when with those he liked a gift of conversation that flowed like a full river of sunshine bright easy and abundant End quote. mr irving was soon presented by the british minister to the royal family comprising the king and queen two brothers two daughters and two grandsons with their wives with all these together with foreign dignitaries resident at court irving seems to have associated as an equal and he participates in royal visits receptions dinings balls soirees huntings etc as fully and freely as if himself were of regular royal descent Quote, i have been he writes to his brother peter most hospitably received and even caressed in this little capital and have experienced nothing but the most marked kindness from the king downward my reception indeed at court has been peculiarly flattering and every branch of the royal family has taken occasion to show me particular attention whenever i made my appearance End quote. Among his most select and pleasant associates at Dresden were the Fosters, an English family of rank, comprising mother and two daughters, the latter being educated there. In this delightful little circle, Irving early became an intimate, and their house was to him a sunny and attractive home. With their assistance, 
he diligently improved himself in the french and italian languages while among his pleasant amusements were the private theatricals gotten up and performed at the fosters and in which irving and a few english residents participated it may well be supposed that with all the flattering attentions which mr irving received at dresden and the frequent amusements in which he mingled his pen would be likely to make but little progress his own confession corroborates such an inference Quote, i wish he writes to a sister i could give you a good account of my literary labours but i have nothing to report i am merely seeing and hearing and my mind seems in too crowded and confused a condition to produce anything End quote. thus aside from his progress in the french italian and german languages his winter's work seems to have amounted to but little we have from him another confession and one of great importance as he is about to leave dresden in a letter to mrs foster after reviewing the pleasant evenings he had enjoyed at her home he adds that he would not give one such evening for all the routs and assemblies of the fashionable world that he was weary and sick of fashionable life and fashionable parties that he had never submitted himself to this current for a time but he had ultimately been cast exhausted and spiritless upon the shore he remarks with pain upon the sacrifice of the nobler and better feelings in this kind of intercourse quote, we crowd together in cities says he and bring down our minds to the routine of visits and formalities and associate ourselves with littleness and insipidity and say unto the worm thou art my brother and my sister we subject ourselves to the claims and importunities of people we dislike and the censorship of people whom we despise the whole swarm of insects that buzz around us cannot administer to our pleasure but one by his paltry sting may torment us End quote. it may not be necessary to moralize extensively upon a confession like this uttered by one like irving a man already famous in the prime of manhood moving in the very highest circles flattered and caressed as extensively as he was known but we can scarcely refrain from reverting to another confession following a course of prosperity the most magnificent possible of which confession we have the formula following quote, then i looked on all the works that my hand had wrought and on the labor that i had labored to do and behold all was vanity and vexation of spirit and there was no profit under the sun End quote. End of chapter 17 Recording by Greg Giordano Newport Ritchie, Florida Chapter 18 of Memoir of Washington Irving by Charles Adams This LibriVox recording is in the public domain Recording by Greg Giordano memoir of washington irving by charles adams chapter eighteen having passed about eight months at dresden mr irving departed for paris about the middle of july the fosters left at the same time on their return to england and irving accompanied them as a sort of escort and protector as far as rotterdam having seen these his dear friends safely embarked for london he immediately pursued his journey and reached paris early in august his miscellaneous mode of life for so long a time had its effect upon him and it was with some difficulty that he could settle his mind to any weighty and steady literary pursuit he passed the autumn in some dramatic efforts which at the insistence of mr payne he was induced in company with the latter to undertake these consisted of the translation and recasting of certain french plays to be modified and fitted to the english stage it was stipulated that irving's name should not appear in connection with these productions which were afterward acted with success in london the ensuing winter seems to have passed without much literary labor his journal presents him as reading various authors dining with various friends 
and giving less attention to theatres than formerly we find him engaged in some revision of salmagundi for a french publisher the same publisher galganani proposes to him the setting up of an edition of english authors accompanied with biographical sketches irving accepts the proposition stipulating for two hundred and fifty francs per volume and at once commenced on this new enterprise beginning with a life of goldsmith in the spring he arranges by correspondence with his london publisher for the purchase of his forthcoming tales of a traveller for four thousand five hundred dollars the manuscript was partly prepared and after the arrangement with his publisher he seems to have proceeded more diligently than before with the work at the same time giving encouragement to his publisher that it would excel any of his former works at the end of spring he leaves paris for london where he was invited by the poet spencer to take lodgings with him footnote william robert spencer was the grandson of the duke of marlborough born in seventeen sixty nine was a wit and man of fashion his poems were principally ballads and occasional pieces some of which are of special elegance he died in paris in eighteen thirty four and in the following year his poems with a memoir were collected and published End of footnote. he also enjoys pleasant relations with the poet rogers with whom he had frequent interesting conversations footnote samuel rogers was born in seventeen sixty three his pleasures of memory first gave him a place among english poets besides this his voyage of columbus jacqueline human life and italy were his principal poetic productions he was offered the laureateship on the death of wordsworth which by reason of his advanced age he declined rogers was a gentleman of fortune and ample hospitalities and for half a century his house was a favorite resort of literary men he seems to have written slowly the pleasures of memory occupying him nine years about eighty lines a year human life about the same time and italy sixteen years he retained his faculties to near the close of life dying in eighteen fifty five at the age of ninety two end of footnote in june he spends some days at the manor house of mr compton quote, a complete specimen of a complete country gentleman end quote. here he is greatly delighted with the scenery residence and its occupants thence he goes to bath where he again meets his friend moore and accompanies him to his beautiful cottage a few miles away after a brief visit with his sister and family at birmingham he spends several days with his dresden friends the fosters at their residence near bedford where of course he is received with the most cordial welcome he subsequently makes a hasty excursion to yorkshire amid these various summer visits and movements irving was giving the finishing touches to his new work and passing it through the press having corrected the last proof sheet and completed the financial arrangements with his publisher he immediately left london and two days afterward he was at his lodgings a few miles out from paris the tales of a traveller was published in london august twenty five its publication at new york was in four numbers ranging from august twenty four to october nine at which date the american edition was completed in a very prompt letter from moore is the following quote, your book is delightful i never can answer for what the public will like but if they do not devour this with their best appetite then is good writing good fun good sense and all other goods of authorship thrown away upon them End quote. but men alas and even friends do not always tell an author their inmost thoughts touching the efforts of his pen this same moore about the same time thus enters in his diary quote, irving read me some parts of his new work tales of a traveller rather tremble for its fate End quote. in fact as a general thing 
his work was received by the english public with less favor than its two predecessors and it was severely criticized in several of the british reviews the london quarterly finds little to commend save buckthorne's autobiography which is pronounced to be excellent while most of the remaining pieces are little less than quote, the sweepings of the sketchbook buckthorne's visit in his mature years to his native village will call up meetings and memories similar to his in more minds than one quote, as i was rambling pensively through a neighboring meadow in which i had many a time gathered primroses i met the very pedagogue who had been the tyrant and dread of my boyhood i had sometimes vowed to myself when suffering under his rod that i'd have my revenge if i ever met him when i had grown to be a man the time had come but i had no disposition to keep my vow the few years which had matured me into a vigorous man had shrunk him into decrepitude he appeared to have had a paralytic stroke i looked at him and wondered that this poor helpless mortal could have been an object of terror to me that i should have watched with anxiety the glance of that failing eye or dreaded the power of that trembling hand he tottered feebly along the path and had some difficulty in getting over a stile i ran and assisted him he looked at me with surprise but did not recognize me and made a low bow of humility and thanks i had no disposition to make myself known for i felt that i had nothing to boast of the pains he had taken and the pains he had inflicted had been equally useless his repeated predictions had been fully verified and i felt that little jack buckthorne the idle boy had grown to be a very good-for-nothing man End quote. farther on are portrayed buckthorne's visit to his mother's grave and his experiences there quote, i sought my mother's grave the weeds were already matted over it and the tombstone was half hid among nettles i cleared them away and they stung my hands but i was heedless of the pain for my heart ached too severely i sat down on the grave and read over and over again the epitaph on the stone it was simple but it was true i had written it myself i had tried to write a poetical epitaph but in vain my feelings refused to utter themselves in rhyme my heart had gradually been filling during my lonely wanderings it was now charged to the brim and overflowed i sank upon the grave and buried my face in the tall grass and wept like a child yes i wept in manhood upon the grave as i had in infancy upon the bosom of my mother alas how little do we appreciate a mother's tenderness while living how heedless are we in youth of all her anxieties and kindness but when she is dead and gone when the cares and coldness of the world come withering to our hearts when we find how hard it is to find true sympathy how few love us for ourselves how few will befriend us in our misfortunes then it is that we think of the mother we have lost it is true i had always loved my mother even in my most heedless days but i felt how inconsiderate and ineffectual had been my love my heart melted as i retraced the days of infancy when i was led by a mother's hand and rocked to sleep in a mother's arms and was without care or sorrow oh my mother exclaimed i burying my face again in the grass of the grave oh that i were once more by your side sleeping never to wake again on the cares and troubles of this world End quote. End of chapter eighteen recording by greg giordano newport ritchie florida chapter nineteen of memoir of washington irving by charles adams this librivox recording is in the public domain blackwood for january eighteen twenty five 
indulges in a sort of sweeping and amusing resume of Irving and so many of his works as have thus far been alluded to, and comprising a curious intermingling of the sweet and the bitter. It considers that the author had been abused by overmuch praise, and then by being treacherously neglected by his friends, and affects to come to the rescue and generously place him upon his true position. Yes, it is time, says Blackwood, John Neal, for us to interpose. We throw our shield over him, therefore. We undertake, once for all, to see fair play. Open the field, withdraw the rabble, drive back the dogs, give him fair play, and we will answer for his acquitting himself like a man. If he do not, why, let him be torn to pieces, and be... In the day of his popularity, we showed him no favor. In this, the day of his tribulation, we shall show him none. He does not require any. We saw his faults when there was nobody else to see them. We put our finger upon the sore places about him, drove our weapon home up to the hilt, wherever we found a hole in his beautiful armor, a joint visible in his golden harness, treated him, in short, as he deserves to be treated, like a man. But we have never done, we never will do him wrong. One word of his life and personal appearance, both of which are laughably misrepresented, before we take up his works. He was born, we believe, in the city of New York, began to write for a newspaper at an early age, read law, but gave it up in despair, feeling, as Cowper did before him, a disqualifying constitutional timidity which would not permit him to go out into public life, engaged in mercantile adventure, appeared first in Salma Gundy, wrote some articles for the American magazines, was unsuccessful in business, embarked for England, whence, since he came to be popular, anybody may trace him. He is now in his fortieth year. Footnote. Mistake. In his forty-third year. End footnote. About five feet seven, agreeable countenance, black hair, manly complexion, fine hazel eyes when lighted up, heavy in general, talks better than he writes when worthily excited, but falls asleep, literally asleep, in his chair at a formal dinner party in high life, half the time in a reverie, a little impediment, a sort of uneasy, anxious, catching inspiration of the voice when talking zealously, writes a small, neat hand, like Montgomery, Alan Cunningham, or Shea. It is like that of each. Indolent, nervous, irritable, easily depressed, easily disheartened, very amiable, no appearance of special refinement, nothing remarkable, nothing uncommon about him. Precisely such a man, to say all in a word, as people would continually overlook, pass by without notice or forget after dining with him, unless, peradventure, his name were mentioned, in which case, odds bobs, they are all able to recall something remarkable in his way of sitting, eating, or looking, though, like Oliver Goldsmith himself, he had never opened his mouth while they were near, or sat in a high chair as far into it as he could get with his toes just reaching the floor. We now come to the works of Geoffrey. 1. The Newspaper Essays Boyish, theatrical criticisms, nothing more, foolishly and wickedly reproduced by some base mercenary countrymen of his, from the rubbish of old printing offices, put forth as by the author of the sketch-book. How could such things be by the author of the sketch-book, written as they were twenty years before the sketch-book was thought of? By whom were they written? By a boy. Was he the author of what we call the sketch-book? No, the sketch-book was written by a man, a full-grown man. Ergo, the American publisher told a... Uh... Nevertheless, there is a touch of Irving's quality in these pages, paltry as they are. A little of that happy, sly humor, that grave pleasantry, wherein he resembles Goldsmith so much. That quiet, shrewd, good-humored sense of the ridiculous which altogether, in our opinion, go to make up the chief excellence of Geoffrey, that which will outlive the fashion of this day, and set him apart, after all, from every other writer in our language. Salamagundi, or the Whim-Whams. 
it is a work in two volumes duodecimo essays after the manner of goldsmith a downright secret labored continual imitation of him abounding too in plagiarisms the title is from our english flimflams oriental papers the little man in black etc from the citizen of the world parts are capital as a whole the work is quite superior to anything of the kind which this age has produced knickerbocker a droll humorous history of new york while the dutch who settled it were in power conceived matured and brought forth in a bold original temper unaided and unalone by irving more entirely the natural thought language humor and feeling of the man himself without imitation or plagiarism far more than either of his late works it is written too in the fever and flush of his popularity at home after he had got a name such as no other man had among his countrymen after salamagundi had been read with pleasure all over north america in it however there is a world of rich allusion a vein of sober caricature the merit of which is little understood here take an example von poffenberg is a portrait outrageously distorted on some accounts but nevertheless a portrait of general wilkinson a bellipotent officer who sent in a bill to congress for sugar plums or cigars or both after throwing up in disgust we dare say as he could not stomach it his military command upon the florida frontier so too in the three dutch governors we could point out a multitude of laughable secret allusions to three of the american chief magistrates adams jefferson madison which have not always been well understood anywhere by anybody save those who are familiar with american history by nine readers out of ten perhaps knickerbocker is read as a piece of generous drollery nothing more be it so it will wear the better the design of irving himself is not always clear nor was he always undeviating in his course truth or fable fact or falsehood it was all the same to him if a bit of material came in his way in a word we look upon this volume of knickerbocker though it is tiresome though there are some wretched failures in it a little overdoing of the humorous and a little confusion of purpose throughout as a work honorable to english literature manly bold and so altogether original without being extravagant as to stand alone among the labors of men naval biography some of these papers are bravely done in general they are eloquent simple clear and thoughtful among the lives that of poor perry the young freshwater nelson who swept lake erie of our fleet in such a gallant seamanlike style is quite remarkable as containing within itself proof that irving has the heart of a poet it is not when he tries that irving is poetical it is only where he is transported suddenly by some beautiful thought carried away without knowing why by inward music his heart beating his respiration hurried he is never the man to call up the anointed before him at will to imagine spectacles or people the air earth and sea like a wizard by the waving of his hand he has only the heart of a poet he has not he never will have the power of one it is too late now power comes of perpetual warfare trial hardship he has grown up in perpetual quiet sunshine a sort of genteel repose he may continue therefore to feel poetry to think poetry to utter poetry by chance but he will never be able to do poetry now as he might have done it before this if he had been worthily tempered year after year by wind or fire rain or storm sketchbook irving had now come to be regarded as a professional author to think of his pen for a livelihood his mercantile speculations were disastrous we are glad of it it is all the better for him his country our literature us but for that lucky misfortune he would never have been half what he now is but for his present humiliation he would never be half what he will now be if we rightly understand his character strange but so it was the accidental association the fortuitous conjunction of two or three young men for the purpose of amusing the town with a few pages a month in salamagundi 
led straightway to a total change of all their views in life. Two of them, certainly, perhaps all three, became professional authors in a country where only one, poor Brown, had ever appeared before. Two of them have become greatly distinguished writers, the third, Verplank, somewhat so by the little that he has written. The sketchbook is a timid, beautiful work, with some childish pathos in it, some rich, pure, bold poetry, a little squeamish, puling, ladylike sentimentality, some courageous writing, some wit, and a world of humor so happy, so natural, so altogether unlike that of any other men, dead or alive, that we would rather have been the writer of it fifty times over than of anything else that he has ever written. The touches of poetry are everywhere, but never where one would look for them. Irving has no passion. He fails utterly in true pathos. He cannot speak as if he were carried away by anything. He is always thoughtful, and save where he tries to be fine or sentimental, always at home, always natural. The dusty splendor of Westminster Abbey, the ship staggering over the precipices of the ocean, the shark darting like a specter through the blue waters, all these things are poetry, such poetry as never was, never will be surpassed. We could mention fifty more passages, epithets, words of power, which no mere prose writer would have dared under any circumstances to use. They are like the invincible looks of Milton, revealing the god in spite of every disguise. The bravest article that Irving ever wrote is that about our English writers on America. There is more manhood, more sincerity, more straightforward, generous, plain dealing in that one paper than perhaps in all his other works. He felt what he said, every word of it, had nothing to lose, and of course wrote intrepidly. Did we like him the worse for it? No, indeed. It was that very paper which made him respectable in this country. Rip Van Winkle is well done, but we have no patience with such a man as Washington Irving. We cannot keep our temper when we catch him pilfering the materials of other men, working up old stories. We had as lief see him before the public for some Bow Street offense. The wife is ridiculous with some beautiful description, but Irving, as we said before, has no idea of true passion, suffering, or deep, desolating power. The mutability of literature, the art of bookmaking, etc., are only parts of the same essay. It has no superior in our language. Traits of Indian character. Very good, very, so far as they go, historically true. Irving has been instrumental, however, by twice taking the field in favor of the North American savages. He has made it fashionable. Bracebridge Hall, stout gentleman, very good, and a pretty fair account of real occurrence. Student of Salamanca, beneath contempt, Irving has no idea of genuine romance, or love, or anything else, we believe, that ever seriously troubles the blood of men. Rookery, struck off in a few hours, contrary to what has been said. Irving does not labor, as people suppose. He is too indolent, given too much, we know, to reverie. Dolph Helliger, The Haunted House, Storm Ship, all in the fashion of his early time. Perhaps, we are greatly inclined so to believe, perhaps the remains of what was meant for Salamagundi or Knickerbocker. The rest of the two volumes quite unworthy of Irving's reputation. Tales of a Traveller. We hardly know how to speak of this sad affair when we think of what Irving might have done without losing our temper. It is bad enough, base enough, to steal that which would make us wealthy forever, but like the plundering Arab, to steal rubbish, anything from anybody, everybody, would indicate a man of helpless moral temperament, a standard of self-estimation beneath everything. No wonder that people have begun to question his originality when they find him receiving the paltry material of newspapers, letters, romances. In the early part of these two volumes we shall never see any merit, knowing as we do the sources of what he is serving up, however admirable were his new arrangement of the dishes, however great his improvement. A part of the book, a few scenes, a few pages, are quite equal to anything that he ever wrote. The reviewer thus concludes, one word of advice to him before we part, 
probably forever. No man gets credit by repeating the story of another. It is like dramatizing a poet. If you succeed, he gets all the praise. If you fail, you get all the disgrace. You, Geoffrey Crayon, have great power, original power. We rejoice in your failure now because we believe it will drive you into a style of original composition far more worthy of yourself. Go to work. Lose no time. Your foundations will be the stronger for this reform. You cannot write a novel, a poem, a love tale, or a tragedy, but you can write another sketchbook worth all that you have ever written if you will draw only from yourself. You have some qualities that no other living writer has, a bold, quiet humor, a rich, beautiful mode of painting without caricature, a delightful, free, happy spirit. Make use of them. We look to see you all the better for this trouncing. God bless you. Farewell. End of chapter 19. Recording by Maria Casper. Chapter 20 of Memoir of Washington Irving by Charles Adams. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Irving, as we have seen, returned to Paris simultaneously with the publication of Tales of a Traveler, and from the summer of 1824 he resided there an entire year. During the autumn he occupied lodgings a short distance out of the city, in order that he might be free from the various annoying interruptions to which he was subjected in town. He had become famous in literature, and this led to sundry calls and many invitations to fashionable visits, parties, balls, etc., amusements which had now obviously lost in some degree their charm for him, while they proved a sad interference with his intellectual and literary pursuits. At the same time, however, it is quite noticeable that during the autumn of 1824 and throughout the year 1825, Irving accomplished comparatively little with his pen. His new work had encountered, as we have seen, some severe strictures from the critics, both in England and America, and his sensitive nature quailed under the influence, and his spirits were often much depressed. Some of his letters betray decided regrets that he had not adopted a different path of life, devoting himself in his youth to some substantial and regular employment, and not have ventured upon the uncertain career of literature. To a promising nephew who had recently graduated, and who seemed somewhat inclined to a literary life, he addressed about this time a deeply interesting letter, in which he expressed a hope that none of his near and special friends would be led to imitate his example in wandering into what he terms the seductive and treacherous paths of literature. He assured his nephew that such a life was precarious, both as to profits and enjoyment, that though he had himself been somewhat prosperous in authorship, he would dissuade all whom he could influence from hazarding their fortunes to the pen, and that he was anticipating with pleasure the time when he should be above the necessity of writing. If, he adds, you think my path has been a flowery one, you are greatly mistaken, it has too often lain among thorns and brambles, and been darkened by care and despondency. Many and many a time have I regretted that at my early outset in life I had not been imperiously bound down to some regular and useful mode of life, and been thoroughly inured to habits of business, and I have a thousand times regretted with bitterness that ever I was led away by my imagination." We are not yet disposed to quarrel with admonitions and reflections like these. They may be appropriate to pens that are employed mainly for bread. But the view, on the whole, seems too much tinctured with what is morbid and worldly. The pen may have and perform a mission as sacred and noble as the Christian ministry itself, and hence duty, as truly as a mere expediency, may point to a diligent and conscientious career of authorship. With the views alluded to by Irving in this letter to his nephew, a man may write or do otherwise, as may be his preference. But a more elevated and purer vision may lead one to decide and act on a very different principle. If it be in an author's mind to write for the mere amusement of his readers, we may conceive it optional with himself whether he will write or engage in one of sundry other occupations, but if, on the other hand, there seem a necessity upon him to write for the edification of the multitude, 
then the optional feature is by no means so apparent. As winter came on, Irving removed into town and established his quarters with his brother Peter, who was also living a bachelor life at Paris. Previously, however, and in the early days of October, the two brothers made an excursion into the country, that they might enjoy an opportunity to see more of the beautiful realm of France than they had yet observed. The weather proved to be all that they could wish, being serene and delightful, while the golden autumn imparted its peculiar tints to the pleasant and sprightly scenery that opened up before them on every hand. Their path lay along the banks of the Loire, and towns and castles famous in story, and richly wooded hills overlooking far-reaching vales, were spread out before them in enchanting loveliness. After a nine days ramble, they returned to their winter quarters in Rue Richelieu, number 89. Their establishment here seems to have been very complete and comfortable, except that it had to be reached by mounting several flights of stairs. Their rooms opened into each other and were excellently well fitted up and furnished. A French servant woman acted as cook, chambermaid, butler, and footman, who, says Irving, keeps everything in the neatest order and chatters even faster than she works. The brothers had their separate rooms, and each could follow his own business without interfering with the other. One of the very best libraries in the world was within five minutes' walk of their lodgings, and to which they enjoyed full and free access. Is not here a picture for a student or an author? Surely much might be expected from comforts and advantages like these. Yet, as we have already noticed, but little was accomplished under circumstances so propitious. The autumn, winter, and the succeeding spring and summer passed away, leaving but slight fruits of that facile and beautiful pen. There were attempts at plottings and plannings. One and another theme arose before the mind's eye. Some essays were projected and written with a view of being grouped into a volume, but they seem to have never seen the light. For months there are hints of sleepless nights, uncomfortable thoughts, a heavy heart, deep depression, and the like. Nor, while his pen was thus palsied, is there much evidence of any systematic or extensive reading, though he was dwelling under the shadow of an immense library. His principal study seems to have been the Spanish language, which it is presumed he cultivated with commendable diligence having in view, even then, without doubt, a sojourn in Spain, and an introduction to its literature. Toward the last of September of this year, the two brothers left Paris for Bordeaux, where they remained about four months. Here Irving represents himself as visiting, rambling, and writing some, and closes up the year with saying, A year very little of which I would willingly live over again, though some parts have been tolerably pleasant. End of chapter 20. Recording by Maria Casper. Chapter 21 of Memoir of Washington Irving by Charles Adams. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Greg Giordano. Memoir of Washington Irving by Charles Adams. Chapter 21. In the beginning of the year 1826, and while still at Bordeaux, Mr. Irving writes to Mr. Alexander H. Everett, then United States Minister at the Court of Spain, inquiring whether it would be possible for him to be attached to the embassy, as he would then, in his contemplated travels in Spain, be under its protection. Mr. Everett at once responded favorably, attached Irving as desired, and forwarded him a passport. The minister further suggested to him the idea of a translation of the Voyages of Columbus, just from the press by Navarrete, and which would probably bring him a liberal compensation. Under these pleasant auspices and prospects, the two brothers started immediately from Bordeaux for Madrid, arriving February 13. An examination of Navarrete's voyages impressed him that from the character of the work it was better fitted as materials of history 
than is history itself and the idea of the original life of columbus was at once suggested to his mind he immediately commenced such a work and prosecuted it with untiring diligence sometimes writing all day and far into the night during five or six months at the end of this time he conceived the idea of writing a history of the conquest of grenada and leaving for a time his columbus he plunged into his new undertaking and in three months the rough draft of the work was completed and he resumed his former manuscript hence his closing record of this year is far more satisfactory than that of the preceding and is eminently worth quoting Quote, and so ends the year eighteen twenty six which has been a year of the hardest application and toil of the pen i have ever passed i feel more satisfied however with the manner in which i have passed it than i have been with that of many gayer years and close this year of my life in better humour with myself than i have often done End quote. a suggestive lesson the retrospect of gayer years is one that of years of close and useful application is another and which will be the pleasanter of the two henceforth and always admits of no doubt or question irving's bow continued to abide in strength as the winter and spring advanced he still continued diligently at his manuscript of columbus various difficulties arose as he advanced new light would spring up on one and another point which he deemed already settled so that numerous passages must be rewritten which he had thought to be finished and nearly off his hands by the end of july however and about eighteen months from the date of its commencement the work was completed and ready for the press as was usual with him it was published simultaneously in london and new york for the copyright of this work mr irving received from his london publisher about sixteen thousand dollars from so liberal a compensation it may be inferred that this publisher esteemed the work the best that the author had yet written southey to whom the manuscript was first shown praised it unqualifiedly quote, both as to matter and manner end quote. a reviewer in the london times bating some alleged faults admits it to be elegantly and agreeably written a most delightful production sir james mackintosh gave the work flattering commendations and it was reviewed with special favor in the north american review by alexander h everett than whom few in the whole literary world were more competent to criticize fairly and justly such a work Quote, this says mr everett is one of those works which are at the same time the delight of readers and the despair of critics it is nearly perfect as any work well can be and there is therefore little or nothing left for the reviewer but to write at the bottom of every page as voltaire said he should be obliged to do if he published a commentary on racine putre bene optime he has at length filled up the void that before existed in this respect in the literature of the world and produced a work which will fully satisfy the public and supersede the necessity of any future labors in the same field for the particular kind of historical writing in which mr irving is fitted to labor and excel the life of columbus is undoubtedly one of the very best perhaps we might say without the fear of mistake the very best subject afforded by the annals of the world in treating this happy and splendid subject mr irving has brought out the full force of his genius as far as a just regard for the principles of historical writing would admit End quote. doubtless this testimony is conclusive touching the merit of this work although numerous others might be easily adduced and from the most respectable sources such as prescott story kent etc we must indulge in an extract or two one the man Quote, he was at that time in the full vigor of manhood and of an engaging presence minute descriptions are given of his person 
by his son Fernando, by Las Casas, and others of his contemporaries. According to these accounts, he was tall, well-formed, muscular, and of an elevated and dignified demeanor. His visage was long, and neither full nor meagre, his complexion fair and freckled, and inclined to ruddy, his nose aquiline, his cheekbones were rather high, his eyes light gray and apt to enkindle, his whole countenance had an air of authority, his hair in his youthful days was of a light color, but care and trouble, according to Las Casas, soon turned it to gray, and at thirty years of age it was quite white. He was moderate and simple in diet and apparel, eloquent in discourse, engaging and affable with strangers, and of an amiableness and suavity in domestic life that strongly attached his household to his person. His temper was naturally irritable, but he subdued it by the magnanimity of his spirit, comporting himself with a courteous and gentle gravity and never indulging in any intemperance of language. Throughout his life he was noted for a strict attention to the offices of religion, observing rigorously the fasts and ceremonies of the church. Nor did his piety consist in mere forms, but partook of that lofty and solemn enthusiasm with which his whole character was strongly marked. End quote. 2. The Ships quote, after the great difficulties made by various courts in furnishing this expedition, it is surprising how inconsiderable an armament was required. It is evident that Columbus had reduced his requisitions to the narrowest limits, lest any great expense should cause impediment. Three small vessels were apparently all that he had requested. Two of them were light barks, called caravels, not superior to river and coasting craft of more modern days. Representations of this class of vessels exist in old prints and paintings. They are delineated as open and without deck, in the center, but built up high at the prow and stern, with forecastles and cabins for the accommodation of the crew. Peter Martyr, the learned contemporary of Columbus, says that only one of the three vessels was decked, the smallness of the vessels was considered an advantage by Columbus in the voyage of discovery, enabling him to run close to the shores and to enter shallow rivers and harbors. In his third voyage, when coasting the Gulf of Paria, he complained of the size of his ship being nearly a hundred tons burden, but that such long and perilous expeditions into unknown seas should be undertaken in vessels without decks and that they should live through violent tempests by which they were frequently assailed remain among the singular circumstances of these daring voyages End quote. three the approach quote, for three days they stood in this direction and the further they went the more frequent and encouraging were the signs of land flights of small birds of various colors some of them such as sing in the fields, come flying about the ships, and then continue toward the southwest, and others were heard also flying by in the night. Funny fish played about the smooth sea, and a heron, a pelican, and a duck were seen, all bound in the same direction. The herbage which floated by the ships was fresh and green, as if recently from land, and the air, Columbus observes, was sweet and fragrant, as April breezes in Seville. All these, however, were regarded by the crew, as so many delusions beguiling them on to destruction. And when, on the evening of the third day, they beheld the sun go down upon a shoreless horizon, it broke forth into clamorous turbulence. Fortunately, however, the manifestations of neighboring land were such on the following day, is no longer to admit a doubt. Besides a quantity of fresh weeds, such as grow in rivers, they saw a green fish of a kind which keeps about rocks, then a branch of thorn with berries on it, and recently separated from the tree, floated by them. Then they picked up a reed, a small board, and above all, 
a staff artificially carved. All gloom and mutiny now gave way to sanguine expectation, and throughout the day each one was eagerly on the watch in hopes of being the first to discover the long-sought-for land. End quote. 4. The Discovery quote, The greatest animation prevailed throughout the ships. Not an eye was closed that night. As the evening darkened, Columbus took his station on the top of the castle cabin on the high poop of his vessel. However he might carry a cheerful and confident countenance during the day, it was to him a time of the most painful anxiety, and now when he was wrapped from observation by the shades of the night, he maintained an intense and unremitting watch, ranging his eye along the dusky horizon in search of the most vague indications of land. They continued their course until two in the morning, when a gun from the Pinta gave the joyful signal of land. The land was now clearly seen about two leagues distant, whereupon they took in sail and lay to, waiting impatiently for the dawn. The thoughts and feelings of Columbus, in this little space of time, must have been tumultuous and intense. At length, in spite of every difficulty and danger, he had accomplished his object. The great mystery of the ocean was revealed. His theory, which had been the scoff of sages, was triumphantly established. He had secured to himself a glory which must be as durable as the world itself. End quote. 5. The Landing quote, As they approached the shores, they were refreshed by the sight of the ample forests, which in those climates have extraordinary vegetation. They beheld fruits of tempting hue, but unknown kind, growing among the trees which overhung the shores. The purity and suavity of the atmosphere, the crystal transparency of the seas which bathe these islands, give them a wonderful beauty. It must have had their effect upon the susceptible feelings of Columbus. No sooner did he land, than he threw himself upon his knees, kissed the earth, and returned thanks to God with tears of joy. His example was followed by the rest, whose hearts, indeed, overflowed with the same feelings of gratitude. End quote. 6. The Natives quote, The natives of the island, when at the dawn of the day they had beheld the ships, with their sails set, hovering on their coast, had supposed them some monsters which had issued from the deep during the night. They had crowded to the beach and watched their movements with awful anxiety. They were veering about apparently without effort, the shifting and furling of their sails resembling huge wings, filled them with astonishment. When they beheld their beasts approach, the shore and a number of strange beings clad in glittering steel or raiment of various colors landing upon the beach, they fled in affright to their woods. Finding, however, that there was no attempt to pursue nor molest them, they gradually recovered from their terror, and approached the Spaniards with great awe, frequently prostrating themselves on the earth, and making signs of adoration. During the ceremonies of taking possession, they remained in timid admiration at the complexion, the beards, the shining armor, and splendid dress of the Spaniards. The admiral particularly attracted their attention from his commanding height, his air of authority, his dress of scarlet, and the deference which was paid him by his companions, all of which pointed him out to be the commander. When they had still further recovered from their fears, they approached the Spaniards, touched their beards, and examined their hands and faces, admiring their whiteness. Columbus, pleased with their simplicity, their gentleness, and the confidence they reposed in beings who must have appeared to them as strange and formidable, suffered their scrutiny with perfect acquiescence. The wandering savages were won by this benignity. They now supposed that the ships had sailed out of the crystal firmament which bounded their horizon, or that they had descended from above on their ample wings, and that these marvelous beings were inhabitants of the skies. 
End quote. End of chapter 21 Recording by Greg Giordano Newport Ritchie, Florida Chapter 22 of Memoir of Washington Irving by Charles Adams this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Greg Giordano Memoir of Washington Irving by Charles Adams Chapter 22 Mr. Irving now indulged himself in another considerable vacation, and, for a year or so, after dismissing his Columbus to the publisher, we discern but little activity of his pen except the completion of his conquest of grenada some revision of his columbus for a second edition and various interesting letters to his friends we find him also again in motion ever since coming to madrid he had been hard at work and had enjoyed but slight opportunities for excursions and sight-seeing in so interesting a country as spain he had indeed transiently visited segovia the Escurial, and toledo cities somewhat in the neighbourhood of the capital but he now contemplated more extensive travels and determined to visit a few other and more distant localities and such as were of historic interest accordingly in the early spring of eighteen twenty eight in company with two friends he started on a southern tour designing to visit some of the more interesting cities of andalusia his brother peter who had been with him at madrid was expecting to join the excursion but increasing ill health prevented the plan and the brothers parted company peter leaving madrid for paris on the same day that washington and his party left for the south their journey toward the mediterranean was safe as well as deeply interesting crossing the sierra morena mountains they were delighted with the wild and romantic scenery through which they passed descending they were charmed with the balmy air and beautiful scenery of andalusia during their transient stay at cordova they regaled themselves with brief excursions among the neighboring mountains clothed with aromatic shrubbery and glorious flowers they saw the shining guadalquivar winding through green and fertile plains while in the far south rose the snowy summits of the sierra nevadas the intervening landscape presenting a scene of loveliness that might vie with the enchanting vale of cashmere itself thence a few leagues bring them to grenada so full of historical recollections wherein from his recent studies he was so deeply interested in which he was so well prepared to appreciate with a sort of ecstasy irving as he approached the city caught his first glimpse of the alhambra bathed in the purple radiance of the evening sun here with his travelling companions he lingered for several days surveying the city and its environs but with irving the ancient palace of the alhambra was a special point of interest he seemed never weary of lingering amid the charming scenery here presented to view and he writes enthusiastically of the quote, delicately ornamented walls the aromatic groves mingling with the freshness and the enlivening sound of fountains and the runs of water the retired baths bespeaking purity and refinement the balconies and galleries open to the fresh mountain breeze and overlooking the lovely scenery of the valley of the darrow and the magnificent expanse of the vega End quote and he adds that it is quote, impossible to contemplate this delicious abode and not feel an admiration of this genius and the poetical spirit of those who first devised this earthly paradise End quote. he delights to escape from the noise and turmoil of the city and roam amid those groves and gardens of beauty and along the magnificent colonnades and marble halls and mouldering towers his mind the while crowded with the historical associations that enwreath themselves with every object that meets his eye 
yet he cannot at present linger and in a few days he is off for malaga the route is deeply interesting yet laborious and fatiguing lying sometimes amid savage scenes in a desolate country now passing over stern mountain regions and then again traversing little fertile and lovely vales locked up in mountain embraces while at times the glorious mediterranean would rise on the delighted vision like as when the retreating greek shouted the sea the sea as the dark and heaving euxin burst upon their view far away on the deep frequent sails were in sight brilliant amid the sunshine and sometimes away below them upon the sandy beach fishermen were drawing their nets with shouts and songs Quote, our road at times he writes wound along the face of vast promontories where we rode along a path formed like a cornice whence we looked down upon the surf beating upon the rocks at an immense distance below us End quote. and here and there a cross would be erected at the roadside designating the spot where some hapless traveller had been waylaid and murdered by prowling banditti no disaster however occurred to our travellers and nine days of journeying brought them to malaga here also they passed several days receiving great attention and hospitality from the american consul then by way of the mountains of ronda they visited gibraltar where they were again overwhelmed with kindness and hospitality cadiz irving pronounces one of the most beautiful of cities whence after a sojourn of two days and taking leave of his travelling companions he embarks by steam for seville distant sixty miles up the guadalquivar after a fine sail of twelve hours he reached the city april fourteen and thus concluded what he esteemed one of the most intensely interesting tours he had ever made he deemed the andalusians an admirable people and was delighted with the country as well as its inhabitants Quote, they are further removed he says from the rest of europeans in their characteristics than any of the people of spain that i have seen they belong more to africa in many of their traits and habitudes and when i am mingling among them and some of their old country towns i can scarcely persuade myself that the expulsion of the moors has been anything more than nominal End quote. End of chapter 22 Recording by Greg Giordano Newport Ritchie, Florida Chapter 23 of Memoir of Washington Irving by Charles Adams This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 23 Mr. Irving had planned to remain several weeks at Seville for the purpose of finishing and preparing for the press his conquest of Granada. He lingered there, however, more than a year, spending six weeks of the summer months without the walls of the city. He had here as a companion a young Englishman in delicate health, Mr. John N. Hall, who had been his fellow lodger also in the city. His sketches of his little suburban home are especially attractive. It was a lonely spot, about two miles from town, and the cottage was enclosed within a high wall, and the keeper locked them in at sunset for the night. In the rear of the cottage was a little garden full of orange and citron trees, with a porch overhung with grapevines and jessamines. The place, he writes, suits me from its uninterrupted quiet. I pass my time here completely undisturbed, having no visits to pay or receive. It is a long time since I have been so tranquil, so completely insulated, so free from the noises and distractions of the town, and I cannot tell you how much I relish it. Further on we find similar contented musings and rational moralizings. We are great cheats to ourselves, and defraud ourselves out of a great portion of this our petty term of existence filling it up with idle ceremonies and irksome occupations and unnecessary cares. By dint of passing our time in the distractions of a continual succession of society, we lose all intimacy with what ought to be our best and most cherished society, ourselves. And by fixing our attention on the vapid amusements and paltry splendors of a town, 
we lose all perceptions of the serene and elevating pleasures and the magnificent spectacles presented us by nature what soiree in madrid could repay me for a calm delicious evening passed here among the old trees of the garden in untroubled thought or unbroken reverie or what splendor of ballroom or court itself can equal the glory of sunset or the serene magnificence of the moon and stars shining so clearly above me during mr irving's stay in this retirement he pens a letter to a young friend whose acquaintance he had made at madrid prince dolgoruki secretary of legation to the russian embassy there so excellent are some sentiments of this letter and so appropriate to multitudes of youth that we cannot forbear presenting a single extract you repine at times he writes at the futility of the gay and great world about you the world is pretty much what we make it and it will be filled up with nullities and trifles if we suffer them to occupy our attention fix your attention on noble objects and noble purposes and sacrifice all temporary and trivial things to their attainment consider everything not as to its present importance and effect but with relation to what it is to produce some time hence in society let what is merely amusing occupy but the waste moments of your leisure and the mere surface of your thoughts cultivate such intimacies only as may ripen into lasting friendship or furnish your memory with valuable recollections above all mark one line in which to excel and bend all your thoughts and exertions to rise to eminence or rather to advance toward perfection in that line in this way you will find your views gradually converging toward one point instead of being distracted by a thousand objects about the middle of august mr irving made a brief visit to palos the port from which columbus sailed on his journey of discovery to the western world here he viewed every spot memorable in connection with the great expedition and inquired diligently into everything relating to columbus and his history a fortnight after returning from this excursion himself and his companion sought a cooler residence on the shores of the bay of cadiz and about eight miles from the city here they occupied a little country seat bearing the pleasant name of sarillo crowning the summit of a hill and commanding an extensive and charming prospect cadiz and its beautiful bay before them and the mountains of ronda towering aloft far away in the eastern horizon the conquest of granada was now finished and the portion which was copied about half the first volume was immediately dispatched to london and new york for publication the remainder was to follow as fast as copied the author also dispatched to england and this country his revised edition of Columbus. The copyright of the conquest for five years brought him $4,750 in New York and 2,000 guineas at London for the permanent copyright. From the opening chapter of the conquest, we quote the description of the kingdom and city of Granada previous to the conquest, together with its people, military character, and political position this renowned kingdom situated in the southern part of spain and washed on one side by the mediterranean sea was traversed in every direction by sierras or chains of lofty and rugged mountains naked rocky and precipitous rendering it almost impregnable but locking up within their sterile embraces deep rich and verdant valleys of prodigal fertility in the centre of the kingdom lay its capital the beautiful city of granada sheltered as it were in the lap of the sierra nevada or snowy mountains its houses seventy thousand in number covered two lofty hills with their declivities and a deep valley between them through which flowed the duerno the streets were narrow as is usual in moorish and arab cities but there were occasionally small squares and open places the houses had gardens and interior courts set out with orange citron and pomegranate trees and refreshed by fountains so that as the edifices ranged above each other up the sides of the hills they presented a delightful appearance of mingled grove and city one of the hills was surmounted by the alcazaba a strong fortress commanding all that part of the city 
the other by the alhambra a royal palace and warrior castle capable of containing within its alcazar and towers a garrison of forty thousand men but possessing also its harem the voluptuous abode of the moorish monarchs laid out with courts and gardens fountains and baths and stately halls decorated in the most costly style of oriental luxury according to the moorish tradition the king who built this mighty and magnificent pile was skilled in the occult sciences and furnished himself with the necessary funds by means of alchemy such was its lavish splendor that even at the present day the stranger wandering through its silent courts and deserted halls gazes with astonishment at gilded ceilings and fretted domes the brilliancy and beauty of which have survived the vicissitudes of war and the silent dilapidations of ages the city was surrounded by high walls three leagues in circuit furnished with twelve gates and a thousand and thirty towers its elevation above the sea and the neighborhood of the sierra nevada crowned with perpetual snows tempered the fervid rays of summer so that while other cities were panting with the sultry and stifling heat of the dog days the most salubrious breezes played through the marble halls of granada the glory of the city however was its vega or plain which spread out to a circumference of thirty-seven leagues surrounded by lofty mountains and was proudly compared to the famous plain of damascus it was a vast garden of delight refreshed by numerous fountains and by the silver windings of the zenil the labor and ingenuity of the moors had diverted the waters of this river into thousands of rills and streams and diffused them over the whole surface of the plain indeed they had wrought up this happy region to a wonderful degree of prosperity and took a pride in decorating it as if it had been a favorite mistress the hills were clothed with orchards and vineyards the valleys embroidered with gardens and the wide plains covered with waving grain here were seen in profusion the orange the citron the fig the pomegranate with great plantations of mulberry trees from which was produced the finest silk the vine clambered from tree to tree and grapes hung in rich clusters about the peasant's cottage and the groves were rejoiced by the perpetual song of the nightingale in a word so beautiful was the earth so pure the air and so serene the sky of this delicious region that the moors imagined the paradise of their prophet to be situated in that part of the heaven which overhung the kingdom of granada within this favored realm so prodigally endowed and so strongly fortified by nature the moslem wealth valor and intelligence which had once shed such lustre over spain had gradually retired and here they made their final stand granada had risen to splendor on the ruin of other moslem kingdoms but in so doing it had become the sole object of christian hostility and had to maintain its very existence by the sword the moorish capital accordingly presented a singular scene of asiatic luxury and refinement mingled with the glitter and the din of arms letters were still cultivated philosophy and poetry had their schools and disciples and the language spoken was said to be the most elegant arabic a passion for dress and ornament pervaded all ranks that of the princesses and ladies of high rank says al khatib one of their own writers was carried to a height of luxury and magnificence that bordered on delirium they wore girdles and bracelets and anklets of gold and silver wrought with exquisite art and delicacy and studded with jacinths chrysolites emeralds and other precious stones they were fond of braiding and decorating their beautiful long tresses or confining them in knots sparkling with jewels they were finely formed excessively fair graceful in their manners and fascinating in their conversation when they smiled says al khatib they displayed teeth of dazzling whiteness and their breath was as the perfume of flowers the moorish cavaliers when not in armor delight in dressing themselves in persian style in garments of wool of silk or cotton of the finest texture beautifully wrought with stripes of various colors in winter they wore as an outer garment the african cloak of tunisian albornoz but in the heat of summer they arrayed themselves in linen of spotless whiteness 
the same luxury prevailed in their military equipment their armor was inlaid and chased with gold and silver the sheaths of their scimitars were richly labored and enameled the blades were of damascus bearing texts from the koran or martial and amorous mottoes the belts were of golden filigree studded with gems their poniards of fez were wrought in the arabesque fashion their lances bore gay banderoles their horses were sumptuously caparisoned with housings of green and crimson velvet wrought with silk and enamelled with gold and silver all this warlike luxury of the youthful chivalry was encouraged by the moorish kings who ordained that no tax should be imposed on the gold and silver employed in these embellishments and the same exception was extended to the bracelets and other ornaments worn by the fair dames of granada war was the normal state of granada and its inhabitants the common people were subject at any moment to be summoned to the field and all the upper class was a brilliant chivalry the christian princes so successful in regaining the rest of the peninsula found their triumphs checked at the mountain barriers of this kingdom every peak had its atalaya or watch-tower ready to make its fire by night or to send up its column of smoke by day a signal of invasion at which the whole country was on the alert to penetrate the defiles of this perilous country to surprise a frontier fortress or to make a foray into the vega and a hasty ravage within sight of the very capital were among the most favorite and daring exploits of the castilian chivalry but they never pretended to hold the region they thus ravaged it was sack burn plunder and away and these desolating inroads were retaliated in kind by the moorish cavaliers whose greatest delight was at tala or predatory excursion into the christian territories beyond the mountains end of chapter twenty three recording by maria casper